recording Joshua Bethania. Welcome, welcome to the Alternative H Hour Studio. Hey, thank you. What you what you think of the boys' toys? Oh, this is <laughs> yeah, not intimidating at all. I was like, where have I ended up? <laughs> yeah. This is. It's very American. <laughs> yeah, down a down a dodgy ramp into an underground car park area and into a room full of weapons. Yeah, could be going. For, could be thinking. None, none, set up. none of these are real, though. You said right? no, no, they're they're, no. They're, they're, there's some that were real and are now decommissioned, and others, are, um, yeah. you know, they, they they can go bang if you need them to, but that's about it. Okay, they look the part though. Probably the handcuffs are, are real. I would assume. Uh, yeah, probably. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the goggles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen, thanks for giving me your time. You know, um, uh, when I when I reached out to you, I wasn't sure if I get a positive response because I don't. You know, busy busy individual, especially what you're doing. You probably get a lot of a lot of requests to come and do some public stuff. So thank you. I really appreciate it, especially as I love I love your comedy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I can't remember who first sent me. Sent he was on Instagram, and someone sent me a reel. And it was one of your bits. Uh, it was the, um, it's the one where you open up and you, you're saying about your accent and mm. and uh, for people who uh, don't see colour, I'm brown. <laughs> <laughs> That's like in the first few seconds. And I just, you just, you just cracked me. Brilliant, brilliant. I started following and obviously reached out since school. <laughs> On the icebreaker, mm-hmm. however, you mentioned you're reading, oh, I can't remember if, if it's in relation to what you're reading. Anyway, you, you were talking about um, experience of imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. So how and where and what? In part, is that in the comedy scene? Um, every, everywhere in life, in really? general, to be honest. Uh, also, to be fair, I did really have a lot of success in other aspects of my life. Uh, and so I've always felt like, oh, yeah, is this? I don't think I'm as good as what people say I am. So I think that's like a default setting that I have. Uh, so even when people say, oh, that was, that, was, that was really nice or whatever, I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful they're saying it, but I feel like, oh, I don't believe you, <laughs> sort, of, sort of a uh, situation. Um, I don't know why I have it. I, I think it's just a Indian way of upbringing. Like, nothing's ever good enough. Like, no matter how well you do. To be fair, I didn't do <laughs> in school. Yeah. Uh, but... It was never enough, you know, and you're constantly made to think, oh, why aren't you studying right now? Why aren't you, even if you get like 80 out of 100, or why aren't you getting 90 or something like that? So, Do you think that, so is that an Indian cultural thing you think, or is it particular to your family and the way you were brought up? I think it's an Indian thing. Because is is that not a similar culture to what it is in like the Far East? In China, yeah. in Japan, they have a Asian, similar mindset. Cause Asian culture is definitely very similar. Like, because you have this, uh, I, I guess most of Asia is very like family oriented uh, setups. And your, your parents tend to influence the way you are, um, the way you are brought up. And um, there's always an expectation of success from you from all walks of life so and it's it's a bit of a comparative thing as well oh this person does better why can't you be as good as this person so interesting because here yeah there's uh, is there an expectation of success for your children i mean some families for most the expectation is is try your best i think and there is definitely it is definitely not okay these days to draw that comparison to other people. They're good. Why aren't you good? Mm. They scored A's in their tests. Why can't you do that, little yeah. Johnny? Yeah. You know. Um, I wonder which way is the better way to go, though. I'd argue I'd argue the, the uh, Asian culture. I, I, I wouldn't say better or worse. It's more like you're, uh, you're a product of your circumstances as well. Uh, because... Like in in a place like India, you sort of want to um, like earn money, right, and build a better life for yourself. So it's it can be quite. You can't like depend on anyone. You have to make your way. Uh, I I mean you could argue it's the same here, but there is some level of support to some from the government to some extent, 
right like even if you're absolutely poor you can sort of like claim for benefits or something so like you that. can lose everything yeah and still get access to food and shelter yeah whereas there you're just constantly like okay you need to think about your future and you need to think about how you'll look after your family and not just your family that you'll form but also the family that you have right now your which means your parents and things like that so everyone wants to succeed in life and there's a sense of pride that comes along with it which is especially and and i think i read this somewhere because the whole sense of like you're constantly being put down uh, especially like in like the way the world sees a lot of indians are like oh no this this country is like you know people behave weirdly or they smell funny and, and so there's this constant sense of oh i need to be better so so people don't look down on me but at the same time i want to be better than you um so that that mindset is just there like i think there's like generational trauma that's uh that's just being passed on and so on so there's a constant need to succeed in every aspect of life and be useful and to have a name in society um so that pressure keeps flowing down and that just becomes your mindset and the next thing you know you're doing that to your kids as well and you don't know where that's coming from it's i, w- I would say it's slowly changing a bit but not so much it's interesting you mentioned stereotype and it's it's one of the reasons I've, i was trying to, i was thinking about what is what I like why I prefer y- your kind of comedy to most other kinds of comedy uh, uh most other comedians and it's because you are playing on stereotypes against your own whatever pick a thing demographic you know, your own demographic your own your uh your your ethnic heritage your skin color and anything like that your your playing with those stereotypes and then reverse them round to take to take the piss mm-hmm. really out of the origin of the stereotype yeah. as opposed to it's really it's very clever it's very clever but it's also really refreshing because it's that um it's that sort of humility and and and, just, and humility exploiting that humility and also understanding that there's stereotypes like exist this is my it's my assumption on it oh, and you. you know the stereotypes exist right uh and do you know what's interesting you also touched on there like india my god it couldn't be it couldn't be any further from those old school like 70s 80s stereotypes of of what people perceive india to be i mean most people probably as a lot of people would perceive india to be a third world country right now mm-hmm. and it couldn't be any any further any further from the truth mm-hmm. I and mean, is that is that something that people are aware of in india and how the rest of the world is perceiving india as a rapidly up and coming you know contender on the on the international stage when it comes to economy when it comes to you know skills when it comes to um uh, exports mm-hmm. i I, th- i think some people but but i'm a lot of people still assume the stereotypes and some of the stereotypes are true like in terms of most of them are just doctors or most of them like they speak with a certain accent which is fine um but they don't realize how diverse india actually is when i go to different parts of the country i get a culture shock i have no clue really i've never yeah. been i'd love to go but i mean so give an example um like the way people <coughs> behave in the north versus the south is very different and i'm i'm just segmenting and even in the north there's so many other things um people are a bit more blunt and ruder in the north whereas in the south they're more hospitable and you know they're more softer and like there was this one place uh, a friend of mine told me like a lot of people assume it's not safe for women right uh, but there's one place where there's a festival that happens once a year i forget the name where they basically go out in the streets and it's like a big party and everyone's very skimpily clothed and like like men women everyone and like if you wear a lot of clothes people are like oh why are you wearing so many clothes like you know dress down a bit and it's a very safe place in general for all of them to live that way of life just to celebrate this festival and that's not something i ever heard of and there's another part where i went and that's in the north on the south yeah some like towards the north northwest ish region 
and there's one place in the south where i think on new years they burn like massive effigies of of santa basically which is like a a combination of bonfire night slash christmas <laughs> and and it's and why santa why santa i guess it's just close to christmas i suppose uh, i i never knew it i saw it, i saw it on youtube just li- like literally last year and i was like <laughs> What what is this place? And and it's a party. Like people get smashed on the streets. It was, and those are things like I would never hear of. Like and there's so many stories that I still don't know. Like, uh, like the northeast of India, for example. Uh, like racially, they look like more Far East Asian, but people don't realize they're they're Indian, and it's not well represented in our movies and our um, like where to blame as well. Uh, like i i remember i met an old friend the other day and i introduced another um, english friend and they were like oh yo yo indian you know they were a bit confused in my head i was like oh yeah i've known him from for a decade now i we met in india so so people don't realize how diverse it is it's pretty diverse for me as well and like um i i, I I remember meeting a friend uh, who visited the city I grew up in because he was dating someone from the same city. I was, and he came back and he's like, "Oh man, I didn't realize it was such a big city. I I was expecting like sand and camels. I'm like, dude, how, do you not see pictures of your girlfriend's family or like her home?" And he he meant he obviously it came across a bit rude, but he obviously had good intentions. But it was quite. funny to see that that's that's how he thought it was because that's how he's been made to think um but yeah, and all all the things about the economy a lot of people don't realize how how big it is um massive country it's giant yeah it's yeah. giant and it's filling up with lots of people too yeah there's a <laughs> the, I, i remember reading a post so if you draw a circle it sort of covers like this one state of india like a few parts of it covers a part of china uh, so if you draw a whole circle around that region the number of people in that circle is the same as the number of people outside of the circle so which is oh right so there's that heavily dense mm. part of like china and india which are like in one one setting and it's uh, yeah it's a lot of people <laughs> yeah so what was the decision to come here then because you you haven't been here long have you uh about 4 years Yeah, on and off about six years. This is my second stint in the UK. Uh, I I lived here between twenty fourteen and sixteen uh, for work. Yeah, this is pre this is pre comedy though. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I I moved on a work transfer. It was, it's just just to have a bit of international experience. There was no no reason as such. I thought it was just good to get out of the city, get out of the country. Um, Had you been to the UK before that? No, it was my first time. Had you been anywhere before that? I'd been to yeah, uh, like places like Australia, Singapore. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Cool. So Australia was like my first uh, international. It, it had a more European feel. Like at least Melbourne had um, a very European feel. So it was a bit easy to, when I came here. I, I sort of got a sense of how people behave and things like that. Um, and so I moved, and I also wanted to travel Europe a bit, like to see while I can, like I can afford to live poor. Um, <laughs> while i was being young uh, and i did that for a couple of years went back for professional reasons uh i always wanted to come back uh and i was waiting for the right opportunity to show up and once it showed up i i moved on work again um i still hadn't started comedy at that time and um, so, so, so what, was it, what was the attraction back like when you came in that first two years because i liked i liked it the first time i it felt like i was able to fit in quite easily i liked the london lifestyle um I liked how fast it was moving constantly. Uh I've always been a city city boy and just that general lifestyle of having my own space like people being polite to each other. I mean at least I think they're polite. A lot of people think London people are rude but um just Do you think London people are polite? Yeah. My god. I should take <laughs> you to some places where British people think they are, they are actually polite and that's like Wales like so so anyway way anyway we've got mountains and it's really <laughs> fucking cold like go west or go north and where it, they're not the most affluent of places 
and they're not cities. <laughs> People are super friendly. Super I've, friendly. I've heard that. When I hear that, I'm like, what? I I feel like people are much. I I guess it's because I uh, like most of the places they're not they're not very actively like when we don't say thank you a lot we don't say please a lot we just want okay cool you know can I have a coffee yes that's it yeah uh, or rather it's like I'll have a coffee or rather you know it's not like a request so maybe maybe that's why you, when you take that step I I suppose if you go to other countries like even European countries right like like France or something <laughs> like. Oh, why are they being so rude? Oh, but this is just how they are. That's it. So, yeah, true. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that. So, yeah. especially, especially, I was going to say, especially British people. But I, I, maybe not especially British people, but that's only my experience because I live in Britain. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, you and people will, uh, God, so rude, so rude. And it's normally about <laughs> people who are different skin color because they've got a different background. Yeah. So the culture is like you said. Mm-hmm. Don't say thank you, please. It's just, it's, it's just <laughs> not done. You know, and, uh, I've got a friend who's. Northern Irish, and he's he lives in France now, mm-hmm. and you know here in, when you drive in the car, and mm-hmm. this is definitely not the case for India, now, I think you let someone through in the car and you wave thank you, they, mm-hmm. you wave thank you to them, yeah. and he he absolutely will not do it. I've been in the car with him, I said, mate, they just let you through <laughs> there. Why don't you say thank you? He said, no, fuck him. He, he's supposed to let me through. <laughs> it's in the highway code. I'm not saying thank you, Jesus. You know, it's a little little tiny things, isn't it? Little tiny things. Where where I grew up in south wales in the in the valleys there mm-hmm. if you walk down the street in a village okay. and someone's walking to and you're going to pass someone you say hello mm. whether you know them or not hello good morning hello mm. good morning and i remember when i first came out when i first left there like when i joined the military and i ended up experiencing things outside of wales in a major way and like people don't do that mm. <laughs> what do you mean people in london don't say hello to you every time you walk past them past on the street because <laughs> they wouldn't stop talking <laughs> I love those cultural differences. Though. I love the cultural differences, and it's. I think it's. Uh, it's super important to get out and travel, but unfortunately, not everyone has the has the chance. Was Australia the first place you went to then outside of India? Uh, Singapore. Singapore. But Singapore was like just a weekend, on the way to Australia. So, yeah. uh, Singapore was my first international place, but Melbourne was when I was like literally by myself in terms of experiences. I mean, my, I lived with my brother who lived there. But um, oh, so you had someone to show you the ropes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he just went to work every day, and he said like, okay, go f- go do what you want. So I would just go on my own, figure things out, meet random people. Yeah. So it was it was it was nice to have that independent uh, because like in India you you rarely are on your own uh, because I I the city I grew up in was also the city to where I worked. So I pretty much lived with my parents most of my life. most people tend to do that unless they're leaving the city to go to another city and then they would live by themselves so my city was the place where everyone it was like the london of india so to speak everyone would come there for work what was the city bangalore okay and uh, so so because of that i i didn't have to travel i was i was lucky in a way because i didn't have to travel too much because work was right in my doorstep uh it was quite easy to get those jobs <coughs> but at the same time it meant i would live with my family all the time i didn't have an independent experience not not that it's a bad thing but it's also like oh, i was like i'm quite quite old to not have an independent experience can i like look after myself sort of a setting and so it was so that's that's why when i first moved i was like it was quite difficult at first like i did, didn't realize how many things i don't know to do um So I'm I'm glad I had that experience and I was like I liked being on my own. That was mm. all that happened. Yeah. Mm. Um so you came back in 2019. Yes. Right. And in within 18 months mm-hmm. you started comedy. So and you and you won a couple of awards, did you not? Uh no, I I actually started comedy just after the pandemic. I mean I say just after the pandemic, just after the lockdown. Because um, technically, it's still on, isn't it? The pandemic. Um, Apparently so. <laughs> you can't get COVID if you don't get tested. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, so basically, I went through the lockdown, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't mind doing nothing. I'm an introvert. <laughs> like I can sit in my flat for days, and I won't be bored. But I think even I hit my limit socially. 
during lockdown where i was like i need i feel like i need to make some friends uh and i was just looking for options what can i do and one thing that i did was like sign up for a comedy course that was in 2021 where but where why did that pop into your head i think i always wanted to do comedy it was always at the i was a bit of a comedy nerd like i would watch a lot of stand up like every time something comes on netflix i'd be like oh this has to be the first thing that i'd watch even when you were living back in india yeah so is there a big comedy scene there um it's like in the last decade or so it's i mean i would watch a lot of international ones but uh, right now in the last 10 15 years the comedy scene is really picking up why why do you think that is um I guess, I guess people just always like it. I think it's more exposure. There's more access to the okay. internet. Uh, they see what other people are doing and they get... Comedy is always a big thing in India, but it is mostly limited to movies. Th- that's why you would get your comedy fix from where you would have to see a scene. Uh, like movies would have like certain personas built in. Like you'd have the main hero, the main like the protagonist, and it would be... Then there would be a hero in... it was like the love love interest and there'd be one clown who was like the comedian and he'd be and usually it tends to be the same set of actors or or rather every movie that they do they'd always be a comedian in the thing and it'll be, it'll be quite funny some of those jokes are incredibly funny i would watch a lot of those and i think one of the but but it's not until i saw like in uh, like an indian comedian uh I mean he's Indian origin but he's Canadian like Russell Peters uh, and he started talking about colonialism and I was like oh I, d- I don't know you could make jokes about this you know it was like and it sort of like he he drew a whole generation of audience to stand up I I think single handedly in my opinion so everyone like you ask anyone in India and if if they're into stand up they'll be like, oh yeah of course I I watched Russell Peters on really? I I would say he's like a gateway drug to the comedy scene um and and then once i had uh, my for my brother's wedding a best man speech which went really well that was like my first high you know where i wrote a joke and people laughed and they laughed a little louder than i thought they would and i was like oh hang on what was the joke do you remember uh yeah i i, I did post it does it work my, without context uh yeah i think so So oh, maybe just a bit of context like my brother's Indian my sister-in-law is English and uh, so the so the wedding was here in the UK and uh, this was the year after do you remember the beast from the east yeah when the big snowstorm happened i i said something like uh, i mean because they don't they both don't live in the UK i said i knew uh, she would miss the british weather she missed I didn't think she'd miss the beast from the east so much that she'd actually marry one. So um and uh I and it was like a tag I feel like there was a better joke before that um so which which so I, I put you yeah. on the spot so yeah. <laughs> and uh and that was that was a high and it, it just didn't stay that day like even the next day when we were having breakfast in the hotel people were like oh I really liked your speech and I'm like oh okay <laughs> thank you it was it was very awkward i didn't know how to respond um and i would always mention oh i should, I should probably do stand up sometimes i i'd be I'm, i'm a bit of a like a clown with my friends in terms of jokes but my jokes are terrible with my <laughs> friends but the thing is i i know that they're terrible i find it funny because it's annoying them and they think that i genuinely think those jokes are funny So I you're find, saying shit jokes because yeah. you know it winds them up and yeah. that, that is funny to you yeah yeah <laughs> so they, they 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 always think that i find the joke funny <laughs> but i find it funny that um i'm winding them up do you think they're baffled that you're a successful comedian S- some people yeah <laughs> it's uh like fuck you and and because i i, I know i i think i I I've always understood the joke structure. I always under I think I understand people a bit like what what they would find funny. Um like I I I I've always understood what part of the joke was funny to people. So if if I had to like watch a joke and see how an audience responds, I'd I'd be like, okay, this is what makes them laugh, this certain action. So I I feel like I was always a bit of a nerd that way. Um but and and then once 
I did the course. I, I I mostly did it for the social aspect of it. Um, like in a classroom setting, I feel like I would make more friends. That's how. And and the end of the course, I had to do an actual stand up set, and it went really well. So that's that's. Uh, how, how did you end up? How did, what what led you be in the 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 friend group clown though? Because there's all there's is there is always one, isn't there? There's always one mm. clown in the group, and and is it always fascinates me why they were like that. Yeah, so what? You, very good question. Because I used to, I used I used to try and be the clown, and it was for me it was because I was very insecure, and I was really awkward socially. Mm. Like I wasn't I did never very good social skills at all when I was younger, and so I would counter that. By making people laugh, and a lot of times at my own expense, I was just humiliating myself. Mm-hmm. But I, because it, I would try and make people laugh, and it's a positive response, right? So okay, in all this negativity I perceive, you're around me, and I'm got many friends, and I'm the weird kid, and I'm ginger, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's but I can make them laugh by doing different things, yeah. And that, I think that's why I did that. Okay. What what what, what, what about you? Oh, that's a very good question. I, I've always been a people pleaser. I I liked I, I I just couldn't handle awkward I mean not, not awkward situations like I don't like it when there's a negative environment like even if there's a fight or something so <coughs> jokes are an easier go to um I I guess it's because I watched a lot of funny things and that excited me the most in a movie or something I didn't want to be like like whatever the like in you know, the protagonist like he's the main thing and everyone wants to see him I, those things didn't excite me so much i i like the the funny parts i that's what i would wait to see a movie for i guess seeing that constantly and um i don't know maybe maybe i was uh, insecure about things in terms of i maybe i i would never be the the cool guy who would would find the love interest <laughs> the main things maybe, maybe maybe it's that and i thought oh this is more like a easier role <laughs> to adopt i can be that that funny guy um yeah that's f- fascinating i should bring this up in therapy <laughs> 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 when i sign up for it uh, <laughs> but yeah you've given me something to think about <laughs> my pleasure my pleasure <laughs> what was your what was your what was your first what was your first gig? So you 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 went and did this comedy course up randomly, okay? Yeah. And you would because you're just looking for something to do, right? And you yeah. thought, okay, I've, I've kind of thought about this in the yeah. past. I, I mean, thought it would also help me work-wise because as a so I work as a program manager, and I tend to my role is to bring people into a meeting room and drive the conversation. And I've always been like I used to be an engineer, and I would work alone by myself without having to speak to a lot of people uh and now i've taken up this role where i constantly speak to people and especially in a big setting and with senior people so i thought it would help me speak better um which it did not but <laughs> uh it's a big leap that it's a big leap to go from introvert it engineer to yeah. program manager and i speak from experience of working with you know, as you know a project manager of working with IT engineers mm-hmm. and I've only started doing that relatively recently the last mm-hmm. two two three years yeah and they like you describe yeah 90% they, 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 they are like the the the, the uh, stereotype that people paint them with yeah like introvert very different no oh, noticeably different yeah. from most other people <laughs> like they're not the most social and definitely um not always the most confident when it comes to public speaking or even just having to say something in a meeting with a bunch of people on. Yeah. Yep. You know, but brilliant at what they do. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I get, I get where you're coming from. Yeah. It's like everyone's a Mark Zuckerberg. Like, he's so socially awkward, So, but he's the CEO, he has to speak. So when you see him speak, you're like, okay, this guy's a weird dude. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, so, so I wanted to fix that. So I thought this would help me. Uh, that's why I did the, that was my intention. And, and the social element which is like just meet other people from different walks of life and like making friends is a bit easier to have a sustaining friendship if you meet people on a regular basis 
rather than a one off event or something where you try to network with some people it's hard to keep it going whereas if you see the same set of people again and again it's a bit easier for me to form that friendship over time rather than to create that lasting impression in just one meeting so yeah um first gig after the after the comedy co- course what was that so it was supposed to be at the bill murray uh, at the end of the course but because of this was when when omicron was <laughs> was flying about uh, so that kept delaying every now and then but i knew a few others who signed up to this place called comedy virgins which is a nice little club in south london at the cavendish arms in stockwell um it's an incredible place to go for first timers as the name suggests it's like people who've never really done comedy or people who are just just about starting to uh it's a very supportive environment so i just you're supposed to bring in a bring a friend with you just because you can fill up the audience a bit because nobody is going to sell like first time as a good comedy show um and you get on stage you you, you get to perform 5 minutes of your material uh i did that and it was it was good it was i th- i thought it went well um for for someone with zero stage time experience how many uh, people were in the crowd uh about 25ish what was that experience like before and getting ready for that gig we were you were you um crapping yourself i i would practice a lot i would try to make sure i would not forget my words but what i did not prepare for was the laughter <laughs> <laughs> right like oh when people people react in different ways to different jokes so i would like memorize everything i'm like i i know this at the back of my head now but then you i didn't practice it with interrupted laughter and like uh, it's almost like i was like can you guys stop laughing I'm, i'm forgetting <laughs> <laughs> my lines <laughs> um the i i did i did like scope out the place before i f- went on stage once so i saw the different type of comedians I, i went on another night just to see what it's like what the environment is like and everyone was pretty shit so <laughs> So so I, I felt comfortable that way. I'm like okay, I can afford to be shit. I don't uh, when I say shit it's they were nice but they're not like mind-blowingly good. The bar was low. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So okay, I, so okay. I felt that comfort. Believe the pressure a bit. Yeah. So I was like okay, I can I can do this. And I had a friend who was on the course, he was doing it as well. Um it was it was a good night. I, th- I think the jokes went pretty well. Uh I came off it had recorded it sent it to a few people and everyone was like wow this is actually not bad and i was like yeah it's a nice little high at the end you know people come up to you and you're like i was really good that was your first time was fucking hell that was I was good uh, and i was i liked that feeling and um, yeah kept at it so what was what was your first paid gig first paid gig uh, was um at Vauxhall Comedy Club coincidentally i'm going to go later tonight um and uh, it was are tra- you gigging there tonight yeah oh yeah yeah i i hopefully i'll make it on time that's at around 9:30 ish <laughs> um so basically i i did the, there's this concept called gong shows uh where um if the audience don't like you they can put up a card and if three people put up a card oh jesus you you have to walk off the stage you just have to stop oh my god the the objective is to last 5 minutes oh my god so <laughs> oh no i could not want to do that yeah it's it's it can be quite humiliating uh i i did that was my 12th ever gig and i did well uh, and i sort of won the night so part of winning that night is you get a paid spot on a weekend so so i got a saturday spot which was about I think they paid me about 25 quid for a 5 minute set. That's not bad. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty good hourly rate that. Yeah. <laughs> and and I I didn't know the other comedians there was a the guy who went on before me was alive with the Apollo act. <laughs> and I was like I I didn't know at that time but but now and I'm now I'm like oh shit this was a big name I followed. Who was it? Um Finn Taylor. Okay. Yeah. And uh yeah he, he's is pretty he's a pretty big name uh and 
yeah uh, that was that was my first paid spot which was it was pretty easy to get like in hindsight like i feel like i didn't do the grind <laughs> just like i just wrote a bunch of jokes uh, it worked out <laughs> got pretty lucky <laughs> that's what you meant to do <laughs> yeah like i i love that i like you know a lot of people say like i went through the struggles of comedy i like had none of it <laughs> <laughs> i got pretty lucky pretty early on <laughs> yeah I, that that format there where you put the cards up my god that must be nerve wracking it reminds me of um the show kill tony oh yeah it's that yeah which i only discovered last year i i, I think this this show was derived from from that okay uh, i think they they they're big fans of that <clears throat> but um so at the end it's like three people they the judges who give you feedback on your stuff in front of an audience so that that was a slightly awkward they still do it which, are they comedians yeah yeah so there's which is in my opinion slightly awkward and sometimes weird that you have that conversation i i think they try to have that a bit, a bit of buff from keltoni actually isn't it That's, yeah they do the same keltoni it's literally yeah. that yeah and uh yeah it's uh, they the intention is to have a bit of banter uh, between the comedian and the judges so to speak uh and at the end they decide who wins so they they run it every sunday night at the club they still do which is kind of uh, nice um yeah thanks yeah one second i'll just knock that camera around Okay, oh, I didn't knock it. Sorry, knock it. I think you just slightly it fell back in place. You still let. You still looking pretty. <laughs> yeah. So how much prep work did you put in for that 5 minute set? Uh it was the same 5 minute I've been doing for the last 10 gigs or so. Um so it's the like I had to like perfect it like little things you sort of like try to change little by little. every other performance or some, some people just do it again and again just for practice because the idea is you um uh, you want to anticipate when the laughter would come when you want to hold off or maybe change the ma- mannerism slightly um read in your read in the audience basically yeah and sometimes you get different responses for different jokes and you want to know which are your good jokes and which are your bad some jokes will consistently get a uh, bigger laugh than your other jokes so would you would your comedy work in india uh not with these jokes because it's very taking the piss of the english um they they'd probably be like oh no what? i mean some people do laugh like when i see indians in the audience they laugh because they are in a uk setting mm. um there are some jokes that will probably work but i would have to tweak quite a bit i did do like a five once in india and i pretty much rewrote the whole thing because and that's something i'm realizing now because my intention was just to do jokes so now when i think of jokes i i should try to think of an international audience sometimes because i could potentially because i go home quite often so i could potentially go perform there uh but i i can't do the same jokes because i'll have to and and that that's something most comedians keep in mind at least the like proper professional ones they're like can this joke work in like let's say if I, even if i go to europe for example not not a lot of these jokes would work like i went to berlin perform once and i had to like think of what jokes would actually work for a berlin audience so what about your creative process then so obviously you, you don't do this, you can't do the same set all the time so you've got this evolution mm-hmm. of the set do you are you so for your next set or the set you're working on now is that a completely different set to the previous one or you evolve in the previous yeah and so how do you how do you target things you want to joke about um it's it's quite evolutionary so it's more like an incremental increase and fade out like a fade in fade out process basically you start with your like in your first year of comedy your uh, the idea is just to do well and keep impressing people right uh, get your name out there and people are like okay this guy is a good comedian let's have him on regularly so that's that's your first year and you sort of try to win competitions blah 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 uh, and the second year is when you start building up your material so everyone starts off with a five uh, and most clubs tend to look for like co- comedians who can do 10 minutes and 15 and 20 gets to be the better paid ones 
so you sort of want to build it up to about 20 minutes of material why are they looking at such short sets relatively speaking to what you see the the you know, the, the huge comedians do like an hour so, so on the specials and stuff like that because uh i mean people do do hours but it would just be their show you don't have a uh, comedy show of the same comedian doing an hour like with multiple comedians so they're looking at short sets basically to cater for the clientele and what kind of a club it is and yeah. and the day of the week and how often they want to put on shows right yeah okay got it and, okay, and there's it. there's a bit of difference between like what what we call club sets uh and what you call an hour or, or a special because an hour and a special at least in the uk tends to be like a story a narrative of like some core yeah. thing that you have whereas a club set is just like 20 minutes of jokes like boom 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 let's entertain this audience okay. and the most of the time they're like they've had a few drinks and they just want to have a fun night so that's that's pretty much there's, there's no message or there's no story sometimes you can you use those to work out premises or things for a larger set that you want to do yeah maybe? probably yeah uh so, so so just going back to the creative process it's more like i started off with the five i hold on to a few good ones which could be like the opening and the closing joke uh, and then i i would write some new jokes and squeeze them in or maybe just add one new joke the next time like re- take off one old joke and add it uh, and keep repeating that again and again and then you can sometimes reach like a 10 minutes of brand new jokes all of which i wouldn't do like 10 minutes of completely new new jokes at once because that can be quite bad for the audience some people do it which is very brave of them uh, i i wish i had that courage because it's it's like genuinely raw testing your material well like is this material actually funny or are they laughing because it's a shit sandwich where i've <laughs> started like with uh, with some good bits and they're like oh yeah we like you but we laugh for this joke even though it's not funny so yeah that's that's how i would do it in terms of how i would write it i i sometimes just have some random thoughts of punch lines which i think would be funny coming from me it happens a lot on the train for some reason and i just wrote write it down on my little one note uh, on my phone and then on the day of a gig if i've got a bit of time i would sit and be like i think i should do at least one new thing today and i would try to build around that punch line write a story see where it goes um yeah sometimes the first time may not be all that good but it's you sort of keep doing it and you know you think of something new something uh, small and it works out well sometimes and mm. that's how i end up going to like different bits of material mm. most pe- most people stick to the same set of jokes for what we'd call a tight five which is like you know this 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 is your best set of jokes and you use that for certain situations for like like a competition or for tv or either a tight five or a tight 10 or for like a big comedy club where you where you're expected to do well because people are paying a lot of money to you know to watch the show does it does it get easier to get the laughs as you become more known and the reason i ask is one of the things i've noticed in myself and observing others is that people are more likely to laugh at you if they already think you're funny whether you're saying something funny yeah. or not yeah yeah uh, like we would talk right at the start of this maybe either the icebreaker was at the start of the actual, or was it the start of this podcast maybe the icebreaker oh i asked you about the i asked you about the, what you said at the wedding yeah and i was laughing at your response before you given the before you given the response because i'm thinking about it, i know you're funny like, i think you're all the stuff i think yeah you know, i was laughing already so i was more predisposed to thinking you're a fucking legend because of previous stuff i've seen yeah is it to get easier do you find it gets easier or so uh like for my shows yeah because i i know it's like these guys the audience like when i do just my art it's like people who follow me and they sort of like my comedy and and they you do your hour yeah yeah uh, so they've come to see and so they they may be predisposed to laughing that's that's my opinion but um, but most of the club gigs a lot of people don't know who i am mm. so i would i would just come and and people like the good thing is for me is um 
I don't come across as your usual comedian in terms of appearance. So the expectations are a bit low. Um, what do you mean by that? Um, like, I think just this random, like I some like usually I on stage I would always wear a jumper, uh, glasses neatly combed, uh, nothing too bright and shiny. Not not like a charismatic personality. Uh, I would not be noticeable like if you saw me in a crowd, sort of, which is fine. Um, so when I go on stage, like the expectations already low, and then when when you hit hit the punchline, they're like, oh okay, let's let's listen to this guy. So it's So it works in my favor. Do you do that deliberately? Um, I didn't, but I realized that's what it is. So, so I'm trying to change that now. I want to be more charismatic, straight up. I want to be high status, just to change that. I, I don't want that um, that special edge, because now now sometimes people do know who I am a bit. Uh, at least if you're someone who's regularly in comedy clubs, uh, they sort of know. So I I would. I I would try to like come across a bit more confident on stage. Um I'm I'm definitely evolved as a as a performer. Um but I I read somewhere like I think there's some famous comedian I forget who they come on stage and they are genuinely they they go out of their way to say very unfunny things straight away straight off the bat because they know that a lot of their audiences just laugh because of their fame. and their success wow, already fascinating so okay. they would never know if their joke is actually funny or are they laughing because they like this person so they would kill the room first straight away like come and do your worst jokes and the audience like what the fuck is this guy <laughs> i i forget who that person was someone mentioned it to me and then they do the material that they want to actually test This is like testing with a completely dead audience, like you're an open micer, and the audience don't give a shit about you. So it's definitely more difficult for like famous comedians, and and you 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 probably notice it as well when you see like specials of famous people. Some are just as they grow more successful, they're like it's it's all right. I'll watch the special, but it's not so, as funny yeah, as I've, it's old yeah, stuff. Yeah, I went to watch. I went. I've never been to a comedy club. I went to watch a comedian. I was in I was in Dubai. I was passing through Dubai. I had one night there, and uh, it happened to be a comedian, a British comedian, and I'd seen some of his stuff, and I watched the trailer for his show, and it was hilarious. I mean, it was maybe thirty seconds. It was fucking hilarious, and me and maybe we went to watch the show in Dubai, and that thirty seconds contained all of his best gags, okay. and the rest of the show was just diabolical. It's di. It was just diabolical. And I think it was that. Yeah, like caught in a maybe caught, not not. I can. I don't fucking know. You know better than I would on this, but caught caught in that caught in the trap, getting stale. Mm. Um, misreading the audience because the audience. Uh, as in, sorry, not yeah. Misreading the audience over time because the audience, are, like you said, yeah. laughing at you because of who you are and what yeah. you've done in the past, which means that you you. Yeah, you sort of don't evolve as you should do. But then other comedians, mm-hmm. they nail it every time. Rogan, Chappelle, um, uh, you know, Louis C.K. and mm-hmm. um, well, I'm named majority American was there. Billy Connolly, when Billy Connolly was doing it. Uh, what was I going to ask you? Right back can to the yes. I just use the yes. You come in, yeah. Yeah, of course you come. Yeah. Right, we are back. Uh, what was I going to say to you? Oh yeah, so the the, the, five, the five minute short the short gigs. What do you call those? What do you call it? The five just five minute. Right, five. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were saying sometimes you'll decide to try some new material, and sometimes you won't. Are they not the perfect places to try all new material? If you know it, like a joke works or jokes work already, like why would you keep doing them? At a, Because um, they're all new faces, right? Most of the time in those clubs. Yeah, it? yeah. Uh, so, so there are, um, uh, so, so there are comedy nights which are sort of considered new material nights. Oh, okay. So, the audience are given a bit of an expectation, like, hey, listen, some of the comedians are trying out new jokes. Some will be funny. Some will be absolute dog shit. So, brace yourself, you know. So and those shows tend to be cheaper valued tickets as well. So it's 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 also a bit of. See. So there are two reasons why you'd want to do your good jokes. One is obviously 
to give the audience their money's worth. Uh, and the other is you just want to impress people who don't know who you are. And there's always someone new, like it could either be another comedian who runs a night or it could be the club that they think, oh, you're, you're killing it on stage. We should get you back on stage for like maybe a weekend gig or something like that. Uh, so you give that, it's m- mainly drawing visibility to who you are as a comedian. People just like, okay, this guy's a very funny guy. So that's one reason people ro- would want to do this, the good stuff again and again. Um, and uh, and in general, it's quite quite hard to like just write a joke that would work um, like continuously. You could probably write like five, 10 minutes mm. worth of jokes easily. But after that, it just gets a bit hard to like keep building on it and matching that level of your best jokes. What's the comedy community like in London? As in the community of comedians, mm-hmm. what's what's it like socially? Is it a good group? Oh yeah, absolutely. At least collaborative, it, definitely. Or dog eat dog. Um, I I'd say it's very supportive. Uh, like that's one reason I I'm like I'm still at it. It's like I made friends straight away. People are very nice. They they want to see you succeed as well. Uh, but I'm also conscious, like. Um, like a lot of people do feel like a sense of um, like jealousy. There's, there's always drama that happens, but nothing. Or, or, and it, it gets a lot more worse as you go a bit higher. Uh, but at an open mic level, it's like any any group. But generally so far, all the people I've, I've met, they're quite friendly. They're quite supportive. They always encourage like they, they send you messages of, uh, hey, there's this gig happening, you should apply, I think you'd be perfect for it. Um, or they'd recommend you to someone else. Um, and and those are like, like good eggs. That, I mean, I've never seen any visible bitterness across the industry. And there will be, it's like, it's just human nature, which is fine. But nothing awful, too awfully bad so far in my experience. But I've definitely heard stories of people having bad times. Mm. Um, but I, I think at, at least at the the newer, like, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd still say I'm a part of the newer comedians community. Um, people are just straight up nice. They, they're very supportive and they'd encourage you to do well. What's your favorite club to gig at in London? Um, I like, I'm torn between up the creek uh, Angel is is really nice. They they got like these. I've got zero idea about any comedy club <laughs> loca- comedy club locations in London either. But they treat me as a complete newbie on this. Okay. So, so Angel is in the area, and there's a bunch of clubs there. So in Angel, Angel Comedy Club is the name of the club. That's where I I did the course as well. Oh, so right. they have two clubs. One is the Bill Murray, and one is just a pub upstairs called the Camden Head, um, and. It's such an intimate setting and the audience are like proper comedy fans because one is the show is free to come in. Uh, you give a donation at the end if, if you like, you know, based on how much of a you feel like it. And it's it's always like quick fire, like good jokes. There's just a good feel about the whole thing. So I really like performing there. And uh, Camden Head. Yeah. Up the Creek in Greenwich is is a is a bigger place feels less intimate that can be hit or miss but i've i've always enjoyed performing there and the big names which i don't perform very regularly because i'm not at that level like like the comedy store uh, where's that uh, comedy stores at uh, tottenham court road leicester square oh, okay. uh, around that that region that's like probably the biggest comedy club in the uk i'd say uh, and it's very hard to get a spot. Uh, like I've done about three spots so far. So you you do like maybe once in six seven months, um, and that too you have to do really well to to reach that once in six seven months mm. stage. Uh, it's generally a very hard place to get, but it's an ex- expensive ticket, and it's like the audience laughter is just like flows towards you, and it feels good. So it feels like a very loud laugh. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so those three are, pro- I, I'm definitely missing one, but yeah, those are like really good. Well, that were the Camden Head. I feel like I've been at the Camden Head for drinks before. Yeah. It's, that's only one stop from my office. Yeah. It's just upstairs <laughs> from there. Uh, 
I think it runs pretty much every night How does it? Uh, I think I don't know maybe maybe it doesn't do one night maybe not Monday Oh it's uh, free? Yeah So you can just walk in I may have to stop by there on the way home tonight <laughs> Yeah You you genuinely could you'll, you'll definitely have I I think you're guaranteed to have a good night even if there's like a comedian who's not incredibly funny you'll just have a good time there I've always had a good time at least I could be biased a bit because that's where I first started comedy so um so, so the Bill Murray is a pub um that's an angel's bar right yeah that's the official comedy club but that was not but angel comedy started in the Camden Head and uh, because they were doing so well it kept going they had to open up a club there and that has no connection to to the actual Bill Murray guy I was going to ask it doesn't know <laughs> they just call it the Bill Murray Yeah I I think this they've got away with some legal loop <laughs> or or maybe he just doesn't give a shit um I I forgot forgot the story but but yeah so so some so basically now when when people go to the club because it's it's all it always sells out when i say sells out it's it reaches capacity because it's free so they send people down the road hey you can go watch other shows here and those are like paid paid shows the bill murray ones um, oh, okay. and you get like more and you get like pro comedians in both places sometimes even some famous ones um who just show up and perform mm. so you you've got an hour that you're performing mm-hmm. now yeah where are you performing ne- that hour next so the next one is at top secret comedy club uh that's the name of the club not like i mentioned it to a friend and um, and he was like oh, okay cool don't tell me <laughs> <laughs> where, um, where is it it's at uh it's just between holborn and tottenham court, court road okay. uh in drury lane i want to say uh like very central london uh just by all the theaters at west end um is one of, oh that's one of the best clubs to perform or to watch a show because those shows are incredibly cheap like 1 pounds and most of the, it's called top secret because you get a lot of secret performers who are celebrities like even people like, like Dave Chappelle have popped in and performed and have gone so so they publish they publish who's going to be performing each night uh sometimes and then sometimes they just give hints they're like oh this person has a tv show and may up make a pun on their tv show name just to if you're a big uh, fan you'll yeah. probably guess it yeah. um like paul chaudhry goes there quite often who? Uh, paul chaudhry uh he's is one of the he's like he's like a comedy legend um like indian origin uh he's got um oh i know i know you talking about yeah you definitely know yeah. you definitely everyone's in the uk has definitely seen him mm. um he's always there i, I think last week I, i think who was who was on uh was it I, I vaguely remember seeing like um uh, there was a big big name uh, performing there yeah how how do you manage your imposter syndrome coming back to that when you're doing these sets and you and you are receiving feedback that indicates you are successful and good at what you do um <laughs> <laughs> i i think it's definitely better to some extent uh, i like i'm i'm training myself like there there've been a few people uh i remember another comedian who just said like listen like she was basically uh, it was like a workshop and at the end of the workshop we had like a show uh, and she said listen i i know all of you all are trying something new here which all have never done before and people are going to come up to you and say it was a good show uh, you will want to think that it was bad because it's not something you've usually done accept it say thank you and just move forward that's it like and so I, i try to remember that that pep talk every time that's been a bit helpful uh, who told you that uh, another comedian uh, named elf lines like she had a workshop in soho theater uh, and we did like everyone did alternative comedy which is very out of our comfort zones what do you mean oh she just did things like that you- some guys did characters i did like a mu- i did a song <laughs> uh, and uh, it was it was great it was like I think a lot of good advice in those sessions that that we had um yeah I would uh, if someone was looking to get into into comedy mm-hmm. like yourself got a you know in an established career mm-hmm. but thinking I could do this 
What would you, advice would you give? Um, don't do it. You're my competition. No. Um, <laughs> uh, I I'd say just it's it's very hard to say this is going to be my career and I'm going to do it because the arts in general can be unpredictable. I I still don't think I'm at a place where I think this is my career. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Cuz you've got a big old following going on. Yeah. And you <laughs> and people find you funny. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I my my main concern is like let's say we have another pandemic. I I don't, I don't want to be caught up without work. <sighs> you can't live like that though no i nothing may get done <laughs> no we do anything no that's true like okay l- l- let me start with the advice part <laughs> is if you want to do comedy like learn, uh, be close to a comedy scene uh, that's one important thing um and just jump on to mics and the hard part is getting past the non funny phase uh you what have you mean by that you have to be ready to the the word that people use on in comedies like to bomb on stage right you have to brace yourself to be absolute shit on stage and come out of it and then say i want to do that again and you have to do it again and again quite often like about 50% of your gigs will be very unfunny and you'll feel shit at the end of it so, so those are the hard parts so when you're bombing no one's laughing at anything you say yeah or they give you like a that pit, must pity be laugh so destroying yeah, it it is but you should sometimes be, it must be out of your control sorry to jump in sometimes that must be out of your control yeah you you some like even if i I've, i've done gigs where i i know my jokes are funny but they didn't laugh because someone earlier in the night has said awful things that they just switched off they don't want to yeah. engage in this comedy night anymore they're waiting for the break so they can leave um and you you have to be ready for that uh which is fine but but i think if you want to do comedy just just jump on stage there are sometimes you go to a comedy night and you see a lot of people who just who just talk and some people who think they're funny realize they're not funny and some people who think they're not funny realize they're funny um there's there's no harm in trying it's nothing's even if you have a very bad gig people are not going to remember it and say like oh remember that guy he did a bad gig no they're going to forget about you that's the worst thing that can happen unless you say some super offensive <laughs> problematic things um they'll probably remember you but for wrong reasons but in general go for it i mean on that like, it seems to me like uh, it's on that the, the, the offense offense in in uh comedy so like, it seems to be like the last bastion of I want to use the term free speech but it makes it sound like a maga support or something. <laughs> you know the last bastion of we should be able to say what we want yeah. but suffer the repercussions if we get it royally wrong in the wrong context. You look at Frankie Boyle. Mm-hmm. Like Frankie Boyle's quite interesting I was thinking with earlier. Frankie Boyle's quite he's actually quite left mm-hmm. in his political stance I think he is anyway from what I see yeah. of him on- online and what he talks about when he's being serious. um I've said that he's never been serious he's always a gag on the air somewhere yeah. but then when you look at his his comedy holy shit mm. you literally couldn't find someone any more offensive yeah. any more offensive <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't care but and only if there's only he, he gets away with it somehow I'm not quite sure he gets away with it in the same kind of way Ricky Gervais gets away with it I'm not yeah. quite I'm not quite sure um but he does mm-hmm. and I, I and I like that exists I and mean, there's some stuff he jokes about or they joke about like oh god I don't mm-hmm. know like not a fan of making fun of that thing but I respect your right to be able to do so <laughs> you know it's interesting yeah i i think um i i would say there's always been free speech uh you 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 have your own audiences is what i'd say i i don't think you're not going to get opportunities because of the things that you say i mean there might be some clubs who have certain principles saying like oh listen here are some things you don't make fun of be a bit more uh, conscious about the times we live in and in terms of that which is which is fine but even what you'd call an offensive comedian they have their audience you can build your own audience you can take your there, there are a lot of clubs who just allow anyone to say anything which is fine 
there's there's i, I think it, i have a feeling it's to be honest i feel it's a lot more overstated that you can't say things anymore people say it all the time like i i watch a lot of shows and people just say it I th- and maybe in your world you can but i don't know i mean th- but it's a double edged sword if you look at the brand the russell brand situation right mm-hmm. like now i don't know if he's guilty or not mm-hmm. but one of the things that is definitely happening is that media and people mm-hmm. are using bits of his from comedic performances in the past or things where he's in interviews where he's obviously being funny mm-hmm. and, and 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 they're bringing those in and using them as those opinions in a joke setting mm-hmm. you know like you don't believe the things a lot of the things that you joke about but you say them because they're funny i'm assuming right you know uh same as Frankie Boyle mm-hmm. um and they're bringing that stuff up to use against him as if it's his actual opinion in real life now brands are difficult to talk about because yeah. the the jury's out so to speak um so yeah, I get you can you can say anything, but only for as long as they will let you. Um I I I don't know to be honest because all the people who say that they can't say anything anymore they continue to say things and they're still going so which is I've not seen them stop saying things. So Joe Brand um I I'm not very familiar with the work. she what was what did she say? Oh, in fact, it wasn't even. A, maybe was it joke setting? Yeah, I think she said something about throwing acid on a do- on a Tory MP's face, something like that. Okay, I think it was in a joke setting. Yeah, but she she. I mean, she's completely been de deplatformed. Yeah, I. So I I guess it. Um, that was a few years ago, to be fair, when it was a bit more. Yeah. Uh, fiery. I, I suppose, if everything's a contract, right? Uh, when you say freedom of speech like this this is like a super wild take that i have because we're in such a capitalist world right you're essentially subscribed to company policies and this could be a famous like netflix service right which is a big company and you're <coughs> signing a deal with them saying oh you have to align with our way of thinking to be associated with us so it's not about uh, this is not this is not a democratic society this is a business transaction that's that's happening here we pay you certain amount of money and you say certain things and because we're in such a capitalist world where all of these institutions control all, that's where all the money is that's where your success lies you have to subscribe to them as well and the reason why they hold on to those values are not because they feel good about that way because they have a certain sense of branding of how they want to appear in general um that that is one take and the other thing is i, I really liked what and do you know anthony justin like uh, he's an american comedian who says the most offensive things and he's one of the most i i think he's super left and he says very offensive jokes like if you look him up you will find anthony anthony jeselnik uh, i've heard the name definitely i've heard that, the name and there's a show called thoughts and prayers he he on netflix and he's constantly so he the one thing that he said was what was it, what which really struck with me was they asked him the same question do you believe in like um a like cancel culture or you can't say anything anymore and he said Oh no, I actually don't because I look at it as actually a challenge. Can I still make a joke to this audience because audiences evolve over time, right? Let's say if you did stand-up comedy 100 years ago, they would make the most misogynist sentences as a genuine joke, which you can't make these days anymore. Why did we change as a society because we don't think that's funny anymore because that's that's not really the case anymore and straight up off- offensive for the sake of being offensive. Uh, whereas the audience has changed can you make this audience laugh because like it works both ways like for me uh, i relate to that in the opposite way because i know sometimes when i come on stage um, there are some parts of the uk where they see a brown man and they're like they switch off completely the prejudice straight away the hands go up and they're like okay i, d- I don't want to get entertained by this guy and you seen that yeah straight up i've seen it it's very visible but 
the easy thing to do is get offended and like oh i don't want to do this the the challenge is can i break can i make this guy laugh despite his prejudices so that's so i, I really like what what anthony said and it was like treat treat everything as a challenge you know like are, are you a comedian or do you really want do you have things to say right uh, so in in my opinion the, the comedians who sort of talk about freedom of speech that like but what what do you want to say you know is is do you really have things to say of value or do you want to be funny so some people like if like i'm i'm a bit of a comedy nerd right so i i like figuring out the joke that would make people tick i i i don't think i have anything political to say i don't think i have a message to put across i i don't want to be that comedian i just want to find the joke that would really land um so i i really like the way he said like treat it as a challenge you know make make the weirdest audience laugh make make kids laugh go to a co- comedy show where there are kids then see can you make these guys laugh so i that that's my, that's my opinion about the whole situation yeah. so I like it. We're we're done for time. You got to you got a hard start. Yeah. Um what uh tell people how they can follow you and how they can come see you. Uh so I don't mean like on your doorstep. I mean gigs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean you're welcome. I don't have a lot of friends. Um I I I put up the good gigs that I do in my link tree which is a link in my Instagram which is Joshua Batania underscore comedy. uh it has links to all of my socials my youtube other clips that i have and i i generally keep them updated of my r shows i have a mailing list as well um which is all on the link tree so that one link is sort of a bit gives you access to everything that i uh, a- any information about me in terms of reaching out to me or uh coming to a show so I'm instagram doing. is joshua batania underscore comedy yes twitter is what uh it's just Joshua Bethania Joshua that's nice an easy yeah. Joshua Bethania but I'm not not too active on Twitter to be honest oh, I mate, just you need to get amongst Twitter I only, I'm on the verge of being in Instagram I'm I'm on the verge of getting rid of it I I think social media like for me for comedy I feel like Instagram works better in terms of converting to actual audience members so that's why oh, maybe Twitter is mostly there in case my name gets referenced somewhere that's it so <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I need to come and uh, I need to come and catch you live at some point for sure. And I'm going to check out this club you mentioned. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Angel first. Thank you for your time. Cool. Thank oh, you. Good luck. Thanks good luck for having it. me. Yeah, no worries. <laughs>